Prisoner J58729, Margaret Livesey, is now serving a life sentence in Style Prison, Cheshire. She was convicted four years ago of murdering her 14-year-old son, Alan. But we have now found new evidence which suggests that Alan was killed by a young man and that his mother should never have been convicted in the first place. Lord Salmon served as an appeal court judge and a law lord for 16 years. He's been studying the Livesey case and assessing the new evidence our research has produced. Bamber Bridge is a small, undramatic community that lies just a couple of miles away from Preston in Lancashire. Back in 1979, one small semicircle of council houses did provide the place with a brief moment of notoriety. At number 41, the Crescent, on February the 22nd, 1979, a teenager called Alan Livesey was murdered. That Thursday night, Alan had his evening meal about six o'clock. From ten minutes to nine, he was on his own in the house. His father was at work. His mother, Margaret, had gone to a nearby pub to meet a friend. In this house, the Matthews family were having a quiet drink with one of their neighbours, Mrs. Rogers. The Matthews home is at the other end of the Crescent, from Alan Livesey's house. That night, there isn't much that we know for sure. But we do know that around 11pm, Margaret Livesey walked down this road here, towards the Matthews house. She saw two boys lurking outside in the street, Andrew Matthews and Tommy Rogers. She knew the two boys shouldn't be out together, so she knocked on Mrs. Matthews' door to tell her about them. She found Mrs. Rogers inside too. The two boys ran off, so the women sat down to have a drink together. All three of them were worried about their children who had been getting into trouble with the police. So they sent the oldest boys in the family, Leslie Matthews and Tony Rogers, off in search of the younger ones. They thought they might be larking about with Alan Livesey. It was to be Leslie Matthews who found Alan's body. I went up with Tony Rogers and I sent him round, round the back to make sure they didn't fly out at back windows at back door. And I knocked on front door, knocked on window, no answer. I come back down and I says, oh, there's no answer up there. She says, Alan's probably gone to sleep. I said, well, there's no curtains drawn upstairs. So he goes up to bed and flops down at bed and the curtains are open, it doesn't matter, you know. So says, just go and check, he's all right. So she gave me a key. I went up and opened the door, pushed it open because it stuck. And I could smell a funny smell. And she's, well, like, uh, it was, I opened the front door and I saw Alan led on carpet tied up. So I said, Alan, are you, are you all right? Like, and there was no answer at all. So I shook him about. Turned him over, he was all wet and that. And uh, there was a red sock around his neck. So as I moved that away, I saw everything, cuts and bruises, cuts and gashes everywhere. And uh, I just tried giving him a kiss of life. And now it happened, and there was blood spurting out of his throat, so I covered it up with my hand and tried again. And nothing happened. So I, from there, I just ran all the way down here. And um, I said to Mr. Livesey, I said, I sat in the corner of the room, I said, Christ, he's dead. And as she went in, she looked in and she says, oh, Alan, oh, Alan. And then she knelt down, put his head in between her knees, and she said something about, I don't, <clears throat> I don't want him to die with his eyes open. So from there, I was going to open the window and all that, I opened the curtains, and she says, no, don't. So from there, I ran to the phone box, phone for police. Leslie Matthews phoned at 11.28 p.m. The police log of that call is the only reliable time check in the case. The scene that confronted the police was a grim one. Alan lay on his back between the gas fire and the settee where Leslie had turned him over. His hands were tied behind his back and beside him lay a pair of red football socks. They had been around his neck. Earlier in the evening, Alan had been wearing trousers and a jumper. He was a keen army cadet. Now he was found dead in his best cadet uniform and best boots. Whoever had murdered the boy had turned all the gas taps on. After she found the body, Mrs. Livesey had turned them off. 
The scene of the crime was to yield many important clues. But first of all, the gas had to be cleared away. So the windows and the doors were thrown open. The cold February air came flooding into the room. At the time, it was just above freezing. This was greatly to complicate the pathologist's job, since one of his main methods of determining the time of death is body temperature. But there was no difficulty in establishing the cause of death. Alan's body lay here, and the post-mortem report showed that he had been stabbed ten times. Six of the wounds were deep, ranging from two and a half to four inches. The rest were small nicks, as if done with the point of a knife. One of them had even been inflicted on an eyelid. The football socks that Leslie Matthews had removed from Alan's neck were punctured by eight stab wounds. Clearly, they'd been put there before the stabbing. And that may begin to explain another odd feature about the murder. Alan lay in a pool of blood, yet there were no blood splashes on the furniture around about. It was as if someone had sat astride him and stabbed him repeatedly through those football socks. That someone, it seemed, had also tortured him. And while that was done, Alan's hands were bound by a necktie. It was an elaborate knot. It went around both wrists and was tied in the middle, bringing the wrists close together. It then went around each individual wrist again with a knot. And finally, was secured by a reef knot. It was not a simple stabbing. The police made the usual search for a murder weapon. They were looking for a knife with a blade at least three inches long and half an inch wide. They searched the gardens at the front and the back of the crescent, but found nothing. But they did find a witness. Peter Nightingale had been walking home along the back gardens behind the crescent. He'd been heading for the house next door to the Livses when he heard the sound of a bolt being drawn. And as I got to this fence here, I just got one leg over the fence, and then all they heard is just this bolt coming from 41 the Crescent there. So I carries on, just gets so far up the path, and somebody comes walking down the garden path there. They were about five, ten, like whitish blondish hair. And uh, they were like had a, an anorak on where I could tell by, by the sleeves rubbing against the body. And then I just carried on through the ginnel onto the crescent and then home. So you remember the person's being, what, five foot ten, whitish, blondish hair. Mm. Anything else about the hair that you remember? To, well, as they were walking it like we were bouncing at the back. And then they got to the bottom of the garden and I don't know which way they went from there. What time was all this, Peter? Be about five past ten past ten. How can you be so sure? Well, I left my mates at ten o'clock when the news was starting. News at ten? Yeah. So, according to Nightingale, something had been happening in the Livesey house between Alan and another boy around ten o'clock. This tied in with the evidence of two other witnesses. The first of them was Susan Warren, Peter Nightingale's sister, who lived next door to the Livseys. Um. It'd be about five to ten when I was taking my daughter upstairs to bed, Tracy. And as we were going upstairs, just happened to hear a noise from next door. Can you describe that noise to me? Uh, how can I say? More like a, a muffling sound, like if they were fooling around Alan, you know. And how long did that noise go on for, do you suppose? A few minutes. I couldn't really say. I weren't taking much notice, I don't think. <laughs> what did you think at the time about the noise? What, what was your reaction? Daddy, we just fooling around with his mates. The other witness who confirmed Nightingale's story was Susan's boyfriend, Ronnie Mason. He was with her that evening. At five to ten, when the uh, advertisements came on, we heard a noise from next door. And it sounded like... Uh, 
the boys playing, you know, and laughing and things like that. And it only lasted a few, well, not so long. And then that was it. At this stage, the police went to Alan's school searching for a suspect. The evidence was pointing to a young man or boy visiting Alan. The police also interviewed people at the Army Cadet headquarters. They even made inquiries about whether anyone involved with Alan might have homosexual tendencies. So how did Mrs. Livesey, Alan's mother, come to be the prime suspect? The police turned their attention to Margaret Livesey largely because of the evidence of two women who lived either side of her. Susan Warren at number 39 The Crescent and Christine Norris at number 43. Christine Norris was interviewed by the police, but she told them that she'd heard nothing at all that night except for the commotion when the police themselves arrived. She was so non-committal, in fact, that the police didn't even bother to take a statement from her. Then, four days later, after a conversation with her neighbor, Susan Warren, she went to the police and told them that she'd heard a violent argument between Alan and his mother at about 10.45 on the night of the murder. Susan Warren had originally denied that she had heard anything from next door between 10 o'clock and the time the body was discovered. Now she suddenly confirmed Mrs. Norris's story about the argument. Less than 24 hours after Warren and Norris changed their stories and their statements, the police confronted Margaret Livesey with what they described as discrepancies in her story. During a session here at Bamba Bridge Police Station lasting nearly four hours, Margaret Livesey confessed to the murder of her son, Alan. It was a confession which she withdrew a few days later. She said the police had convinced her that she must have done it and that she was so distraught and confused that for a brief moment she believed it herself. Significantly, her confession gave no account of some of the unusual aspects of the crime. The intricate knot, the stabbing through the football stocking, the gas having been turned on, the knife pricks indicating torture. These aspects didn't fit the kind of frenzied crime to which she'd confessed. Significantly, too, when Mrs. Livesey was charged, just five days after her son's death, she said this, I wouldn't for the world have harmed my son intentionally. I was under pressure at the time and my mind must have snapped. I am sorry for the trouble I've caused the police, but I honestly did not realize I had done it until tonight. The police still had Peter Nightingale's evidence, though, that a man had left Alan's house at 10 o'clock. That evidence was now retracted by Nightingale. When it came to court, though, Nightingale reverted to his original story of the man with the whitish blonde hair. He claimed the police had pressured him into retracting. Margaret Livesey came to trial on July the 2nd, 1979. But at the end of that trial, after the jury had actually retired to consider their verdict, a juror was excused after a relative fell seriously ill, and a second trial was called. It took place just 11 days later in the same court. The new jury found Margaret Livesey guilty of murder. She was sentenced to life imprisonment. There were grave doubts about the verdict. To begin with, Mrs. Livesey had had to endure two trials in the same town and at the same court here at Preston. Preston is served by the Lancashire Evening Post. During the first trial, the paper had really gone to town on the Livesey murder. The lurid story of the army cadet and the violent stabbing naturally grabbed the headlines. It was all quite permissible as reporting. No one could say, though, what prejudicial effect it might have had on the people who were ultimately to become the second jury. But the first jury had been out for two whole days, unable to agree. The second jury took less than five hours to find Margaret Livesey guilty by a unanimous verdict. In the four years since she's been in prison, those who believe her innocent have focused on three main areas of doubt. One, did she have the time to commit the murder? Two, did the whole truth emerge at the trial? Three, did the forensic evidence actually support her guilt? First, timing. This pub is where Mrs. Livesey spent most of the evening. She was given a lift home. She claimed that after she was dropped at the Crescent, she went straight to the Matthews house at 11 o'clock. This was confirmed by the man who dropped her off. The police claimed that she had walked to her own house, 
murdered Alan, and then continued around the Crescent before going to the Matthews house. This would have taken at least 10 minutes. The prosecution claimed that Mrs. Livesey had arrived in the Crescent earlier at 10.45. They produced the two next door neighbors to confirm this, Christine Norris and Susan Warren. Today, both of them have changed their stories. Mrs. Norris now says it wasn't a quarter to 11. The noise started at 11. Hmm. That's when I looked at the clock. That's why I know 11 definitely. In some of the statements, which I think you've just been mm. looking at again, they've said that mm. you heard it about 10.45 or whatever. Yeah. Did, did you ever say that at the time? I don't remember ever saying that because I've always remembered 11 o'clock because, I know, you know, I usually go to bed at 10 and read. That's why 10 o'clock stuck in my mind plus news at 10. And plus that past, it's just stuck in my mind those times because it's something I usually do. But uh, I know it was definitely 11 o'clock when the row, you know, I heard these two noises. What about Susan Warren? What did she really hear? It's a surprisingly hard question to answer. Uh, Mrs. Livesey shouting. Well, that's after 11 o'clock. I can't remember the thing before. But at the trial, you said that you had heard Mrs. Livesey arguing with Alan, probably around a quarter to 11 or 11 o'clock. You even said you'd looked at the clock at one time when you heard that. Are you now saying that that's, that's not what you heard? No, I just can't remember that. Of course, when you were first asked by the police, you said what you're saying now, that there was a noise at 5 to 10 and there was the noise of the body being discovered and you said nothing had happened in between. Why did you change your mind at the trial and say that there had been an argument between Margaret and Alan? I didn't change it when I went to court. You changed it from your original statement? No, yeah, because they asked you if you remember anything. And they say, it's all right, we'll discard your first one and we'll do another one. And your first one doesn't count. But in your first one, you were specifically asked, had you heard anything between the noise at 10 and the finding of the body, and you specifically said you'd not heard anything. Did you or did you not hear an argument about a quarter to 11 between Margaret and Alan that night through that wall? Like I said, I heard something, but I can't remember exactly what it was. Ronnie Mason, Susan's boyfriend at the time, was watching television with her that night. He didn't hear any argument between Alan and Mrs. Livesey. You said at the time, in your statements that you hadn't heard anything between no. 10 o'clock and in fact about 11 15 11 20 when the body was found no, I hadn't, no. and you said that in court as well yes mm. and you're repeating that to me today yes that there was no other sound as far no. as you were concerned not as far as i'm concerned no were you surprised to hear from christine norris uh, the other next door neighbor and from susan warren that they thought they had heard something else in that time well, yes, really, because uh, she never mentioned it to me. The defence argued that Mrs. Livesey had been dropped off at the top of the Crescent at about 11 o'clock and that she then walked directly to the Matthews house, arriving there just after 11. And there was evidence to support that view. Mrs. Livesey had been at the pub with two friends, Frank Bamber, who drove her home, and Marion Walker. Well, it was time, you know, I looked up at the clock and it was, by the pub clock, it was quarter to eleven. So he came outside and uh, Mr. Bamber, Frank Bamber, who she was going home with, started cleaning his um, windscreen. It was iced over. It was cold and that. So I said good night and I left. And I'd say it was about, oh, well, leaving ten to eleven. So you left them in the pub car park at about 10 well, to 11? Well, she'd be getting into the car, yes. At about 10 to 11? At about 10 to 11. The police timed the journey from the pub to the Crescent at four and a half minutes. Frank Bamber said that Mrs. Livesey sat with him in the car for a couple of minutes before she walked home. So she'd have arrived in the Crescent at about 11 o'clock. The jury obviously didn't believe that. We found another witness who saw Mrs. Livesey in the Crescent at 11 o'clock. John Kershaw. I'd been with the friends at Leyland, and I left there about 10 to 11, about just before. But when I came to the turning for the Crescent, 
I saw Margaret Livesey. She was uh, stood near the lamp post, which is just past the entrance to the Crescent. And what time do you suppose that was? It was 11, minute past 11. How can you be so sure about the time? Well, when I got round the corner, I walked in the house, and I said to my sister, they'd just seen her. Well, the clock's straight facing. And what time did that clock say? It was that one just 11, just ticking off 11. Kershaw's story was ignored by the prosecution. He didn't give evidence at the trial. But the prosecution also suggested that she could have killed Alan after 11 o'clock. They claimed that she didn't reach the Matthews house until nearly 11.15. At the trial, Mrs. Matthews said that Mrs. Livesey knocked on her door at 11.10 or 11.15. But when we spoke to her, we found that Mrs. Matthews had changed her story. I just happened to peep out of the side of the curtain window and I saw Margaret Livesey. So as I dropped curtain, she come and knocked at the door and I went to the door and she said, Andrew's hiding under the window ledge. So I shouted, Andrew, but there was nobody there. So she came in and had a drink. Well, I think she had a couple of drinks. What time was it, do you suppose, when she came in? About 11 o'clock, yeah. In fact, Mrs. Matthews said 11 o'clock in her original statements to the police just after the night of the murder. The defence pointed this out, but the jury wasn't impressed. But we can tell from the movements of Leslie Matthews on the night of the murder that Mrs. Livesey must have arrived in the Matthews house much earlier than 11.15. He made three trips to the Livesey house or thereabouts, returning home each time, six minutes in all. He looked around for his brother and Tommy Rogers twice, about five minutes. He chatted with a friend and with his parents, at least five minutes in all. Then he tried to give Alan the kiss of life. He ran back home to get Mrs. Livesey, stayed with her while she tried to revive Alan, six minutes in all. He ran to phone the police, just over a minute. In all, we know of Leslie Matthews' movements through more than 20 minutes. He phoned the police at 11.28. And Mrs. Livesey was in the Matthews house before any of this. Whatever the truth about timing, when Mrs. Livesey arrived, she was supposed to have just killed her son. What state was she in? She wouldn't, I wouldn't say she was agitated nowhere, no. Did you take note of what she was wearing? I think she had a black coat and I'm not sure. And I'm not sure them, they come to Jesus sandals or some kind, of, some kind of sandals and tights. Did you notice anything odd about her clothing or was it dirty, was it no, bloody? No. A neighbour, Sadie Rogers, was there that night too. She remembers that Mrs. Livesey even drew particular attention to her appearance. So Mrs. Livesey, I've sat on you, I'm at chair, Mrs. Matthews was at you. And uh, she had a drink. She put her leg over, like, you know. She said, look at me, I've been out tonight. She had a bandage on. Well, we didn't take any notice. Where was the bandage? On her foot. I think it was her right foot. Did you see any blood on her? No. Would you have noticed blood stains on her? Yeah. I mean, you were... She drew attention to her legs, as you yeah. said. She, she pointed out the bandage. Yeah, and her sandals. Yeah. So you looked specifically yeah, at her did, legs? Yeah, yeah. Would you have noticed if she'd had blood splashes or blood stains on her? Oh, well, yeah. Sadie Rogers' story of the bandage wasn't put before the jury at the trial. Her statement was not considered relevant by the prosecution and was not given to the defence. But the most important doubts about the conviction of Margaret Livesey centred around the forensic evidence found at the scene of the crime, those scientific details which helped to determine the time and the manner of death. For instance, the police had found a knife exactly like this, one of many in the cutlery drawer. It was loosely assumed to be the murder weapon it had a rivet missing, and there was dirt between the wood and the blade. But despite those holes and crevices, no trace of blood was found on that knife. We consulted Professor James Cameron, Secretary General of the British Academy of Forensic Sciences and one of the world's leading pathologists. I would have doubted uh, then uh, that that was, the, in fact, the weapon that was used, because uh, 
Had it gone into the hilt, obviously, with the looseness of the hilt, uh, one would have anticipated trace evidence which could not have been washed away uh, easily uh, by the perpetrator. Where would that blood tend to have remained if, it had, if there had been an attempt to wash it away? Within the handle of the knife and uh, along the edge of the, uh, that part of the non-cutting part of the knife into the handle. If this knife was not the murder weapon, then someone other than Mrs. Livesey must have taken the real knife away from the scene. Everywhere that Mrs. Livesey could have hidden a knife had been thoroughly searched. But what kind of a murder did this appear to be? Well, uh, taking the wounds themselves, it would suggest that possibly uh, the wound uh, of the, uh, the nick in the eyebrow and uh, the one in the face, uh, by their description, would suggest possibly playing uh, with a knife in that region. The pattern of other wounds would suggest, or could suggest, a sexual connotation, uh, particularly in view of uh, the tying of the wrists, but no tying of the feet. Would you describe this in any way as um, a frenzied attack? I would have thought that it was a slower attack than a frenzied assault. What have been your conclusions in looking at the notes on time of death? Well, from Dr. Benstead's uh, uh, findings taken at the scene, uh, when he uh, took the temperature at 2.40 a.m. on the 23rd, uh, from the temperature, from the presence of rig rigor mortis, the muscle stiffness after death, and the way in which the blood had pooled in the dependent parts, um, would suggest uh, to me that probably death took place some uh, five hours uh, earlier, in other words, uh, in the region of probably uh, 10.30 um, or 10 o'clock. Um, and uh, from his uh, post-mortem uh, report, uh, where uh, he correctly states that uh, the presence of food in the stomach is difficult to uh, be sure, uh, uh, and as an aid to the estimation of time of death, he does say that there was little digestion of the stomach contents. We do know for a fact that the deceased uh, did have a, a rather heavy meal at or about six o'clock that evening of pork chops and carrots and uh, something else. And uh, given that feature and given Dr. Benstead's uh, findings, I would have estimated that that indicates something of approximately three to four hours after the last meal. Uh, which would put it between 9.30 and 10.30. And so, uh, taking all these factors into consideration, I would have thought that probably death was in the region of 10 o'clock. Professor Cameron's estimate of the time of death coincides with the noise that both Susan Warren and Ronnie Mason heard in the Livesey home, and with Peter Nightingale's sighting of the blonde-haired man. But we've now discovered new evidence that someone was in the Livesey home that night who's never been identified. Inside the house, the police found three packets of cigarettes. There was a packet of Dunhill cigarettes, which were opened, and they were smoked regularly by Mr. and Mrs. Livesey. There was also a packet of Players No. 6, which were full and unopened. These were occasionally smoked by Alan, and indeed they were found in the pocket of his anorak. The third packet of cigarettes was also full and unopened. They were Benson and Hedges. Evidence about this packet of cigarettes was kept from the defense by the police. It was never mentioned during the trials. No one has ever explained the packet of Benson and Hedges cigarettes. Margaret Livesey's case was referred to Tom Sargent and Leah Levin at the Justice Law Reform Organization in London. They're now compiling a petition to the Home Office. Tom Sargent believes the cigarette evidence could be vital to Mrs. Livesey's appeal. What is it about the cigarette evidence which uh, has made you particularly interested? Well, the police photographs, one of the police photographs, showed two packets of cigarettes in the room, uh, and I found it quite extraordinary and disturbing that no forensic reports were provided uh, on the packets or on the stubs. For example, how many had been smoked whether uh, any traces of saliva. This could have provided important evidence as to whether or not someone else had spent that night with Alan. So I came to the firm conclusion 
that from the point of view of timing, Mrs. Lipsy could not possibly have been guilty of the murder and that the real culprit must have been the man whom Peter Nightingale saw leaving the Lipsy house just after 10 p.m. when noises were heard by Mrs. Warren and Mr. Mason. And I have to say this view has been greatly confirmed and strengthened by the evidence of the new witness, uh, Mr. Kershaw, who saw Mrs. Lipsy in the Crescent around 11 o'clock. Throughout our investigation, we consulted with Lord Salmon. During his distinguished legal career, he sat as an appeal court judge for eight years and as a law lord for a further eight years. He studied the Margaret Lipsy case and the new facts highlighted by our research. Lord Salmon, you've been studying this case for some time. What's yeah. your impression about the time available for Mrs. Livesey to have committed this murder? Well, I think that there was no real time for her committing this murder. Whoever did kill him had, had to do, or did do, many things. There's nothing a mother would do. Well, that's what is so odd. I cannot understand how she could conceivably have gone back to her house in time. What was your impression of the confession that Mrs. Livesey made? I don't know whether she gave it. She may not have been well. She may not have understood it all. I can't see how there was any chance of her murdering her own son. Do you feel that in view of the uh, impossibility, I think you described it, almost impossible nature of the timing, the strange nature of the wounds, do you feel that there is cause for reinvestigation in this case? I do indeed. Because whoever murdered this boy had tortured him to start with. And it seems so incredible that a mother could kill a son of hers, a young son of hers, in that way. Margaret Livesey has now served four years of her life sentence. If she behaves, she could get out by 1989. The forensic evidence, the witness evidence, the timing evidence all indicate that she is innocent. Yet here she stays in style prison, when she should never have been convicted in the first place.